yesterday. So good day, everyone. I'm glad that we're here from um, all over Africa and even outside Africa. First, some general housekeeping. Please, everyone, try to um, introduce yourself in the chat box. You may never know the colleague from another country that may want to connect with you later. So please introduce yourself in the chat box. And then, um, like Stanley has written also in the chat box, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. If you need to speak, then kindly raise your hand and you'll be called upon to speak so that um, we won't have um, too much distractions. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, this activity streams from the current partnership between OER Africa of Said, that South African um, Institute of Distance, Ed Distance Education and AFLIA. The core objective of, um, of the partnership, of the current partnership is to build a, a framework for continuous professional development of African librarians, especially in the area of open net, open access, open knowledge, open licensing and open educational resources, everything open. Because uh, we believe that yet, that uh, this is really the, um, the season of openness. This is, the, the, this is what every librarian in Africa needs to know. This activity today is meant to generate a, a conversation about artificial intelligence and how we can affect the different strands of openness. The conversation had actually started in the AFLIA OER WhatsApp group. Uh, and then we will share the link later on so that if you're not yet in that um, WhatsApp group, you may join us later. It's a WhatsApp group now, but we hope that I believe and what we are trying to do is to see how we can build it up into a community of uh, practice. So um, we welcome everybody there. So specifically this discussion here today is meant to open the minds of African librarians along the following lines. Number one, we need to acknowledge that change is constant and that technology as pertains to communications and knowledge is continuously evolving. And that as information professionals that manage access to knowledge, librarians cannot afford to be unconcerned about these changes. Let me give us a brief example. Three weeks ago, a vendor of a digital product that I had met um, somewhere outside Africa um, invited me to a demo of their new product. And I joined. It was a software, a software that can map shelves and books in a library so that if anyone walks into a library and you're searching for a book or something or anything about a topic, you just go to the computer terminal in there library, key in your search um, terms, and the map of the library will appear right there on the screen, showing you the shelf or shelves where the books you want are. And it will also let you know other books like that that may have been um, borrowed by others. When, when I was um, watching that, I started sweating. I started sweating and all I asked myself was, what happens to the reference librarians? Who will use them now? The product though is just a computer program. Now think of a library with robots that can shelf books and then this software. And all I can tell you is that change is here. Secondly, artificial intelligence is much more than that. <laughs> this story I told now, artificial intelligence is much more than that. Begin to imagine the implications of artificial intelligence as a librarian, an educator or a researcher especially the generative um, AI, that's artificial intelligence that is smart enough to crawl the internet all, and all available data bases to bring one the, to bring one the um, needed information and to really help create knowledge. <laughs> AI can even write essays and write exams for people. I hope you've heard that. So for today, this is how our activity will go. Our first speaker will be Stanley. Stanley, I find it hard to pronounce this, your second name, Bochia Achampong. I hope I got that. He's no, actually has research. The first name is okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually has research 
coordinator. I, I, I also call him the class monitor, and he knows why I call him that. He will speak on the general issues of awareness, perception, adoptions, and implications of AI on the African library, on African library education, research, and information service delivery. A second speaker would be Liz Levy, a well-grounded researcher who has consulted for so many organizations all over the globe. She's a strong advocate for opening up knowledge. She will speak on efforts to make science inclusive and equitable in African languages, including the role AI can play in achieving this and how librarians can fit into all this. <laughs> Our third discussant who will be Tony, Tony Elliott of OER Africa. He was in the university system. He was an associate professor before he joined OER Africa. Tony is like a friend to Aflia. He's, he's, um, he's also one of us. So, Tony will do a demo of chat GPT. Did you hear that? He's going to do a demo. This um, chat GPT that we've been um, hearing about that can write exams for people that can improve, that can um, provide intelligent answers to questions. He's going to do a demo of it. And um, that uh, AI can do awesome things, but let me add sometimes, not always. I'm sure it is what all of us will want to see. He, he's going to do it slowly so that everyone can follow easily. But here's the fun part for all of us who we'll have the opportunity to query the, um, the, the this, uh, this uh, chat GPT today. When is that time? I will um, tell us what to do. Now, before we start, I wish to state categorically that this is a panel discussion. And we are all trying to stir up interest in an area where none of us in an, is an expert and we are all learners. So everybody, we are here to learn. I am here to learn, you're here to learn. So let's learn together. If you have a contribution to make or a question to ask, please write in the chat box. Um, and please just feel free to express yourself in the chat box. Like I said, this is, um, this is something that we all want to learn more about. We are also looking forward to having a session on it at the next AFLIA conference in Accra next month. We are working on it, but let's see if it works out well. It may be a hybrid um, session if um, it's possible. So now I call on Stanley. Hello, Stanley. You can Hello. have the stage. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hello, everyone. Good, um, good morning. Good afternoon to some of us. Maybe good evening. I don't know um, what your time zone is, but you're welcome to the session. Let me try and share my screen. I have just about 10 or less than 10 minutes to, to do something. And um, uh, I think like Dr. Kim mentioned, this this is supposed to, this um, discussion or panel session is supposed to generate the needed conversation around AI and its implication for Liberianship, um, especially in, in, in Africa, okay? Uh, we believe that the time the time to do that is now. There is no better time to do that but now. And we can't always continue to um, 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 act or not act uh, when, when the world and everybody is moving ahead. And so I would unfortunately limit my presentation to a few aspects of what I intended to do because I don't have a lot of time and I don't want to take a lot of time on presentations. I, I think the conversations is more important and this is actually preliminary and definitely we want this to, to, to generate a lot of excitement where um, various stakeholders will now begin to do something within their various national countries, dialogues and all that. But let me also start with a story. Um, it's an interesting story that happened um, uh, not very long ago, I think early April or so, or late May. Uh, late March, there there was a um, there was a photography competition um, called the Sony World Photography Awards, and there was this um, 
German photographer called Boris, who used AI to generate a photograph and submitted it as an entry um, for assessment. And it turned out that the team of assessors eventually awarded him as a winner of the award. Now, a few days, maybe weeks later, he, he came up on his website to reject the award and then to announce that the photograph that he submitted as an entry for the competition was generated by AI. Um, the reason he rejected and the reason he did that was because he felt that it was time for the photography world to begin to have a debate on um, AI and its implications on photography. And um, <laughs> interestingly, if you look at the image that was used, you look at how it's, it's actually an, a picture of two generations, right? An older generation and then I, um, a younger generation reflecting how changes are. And um, unfortunately, like we see a panel of experts could not even identify that something like this had happened. Now, this is happening in the world of photography. Uh, whether or not they were ready, um, obviously this conversation or this event that happened sparked all that uh, conversation around what to do and what not to do in the case of the world of photography. Um, so what interests us, or the big question in our case, is how prepared are we as African library and information workers for AI? And um, using what I just, the, the, the story I just um, narrated as, as, a, as a draw point or a, um, a baseline, you would want to find out or ask yourself, um, when this AI conversation started, have you, have you heard in your country that there has been any direct effort to organize a symposium to discuss AI and its implication on librarianship in your country, even at the national level? Or have you even heard that it's being discussed amongst, um, let's say, universities? Library, li um, li academic librarians, research librarians at the university level, institutional level, um, debating and talking about AI at all. Um, now let's go to even the public libraries. Have you have has it come across? Have you had any discussions like that? And I'm saying up until when we uh, decided to to have the discussion and we started circulating for African librarians to know that we want to do this. Had this thing even come across in your mind? Um, and so, well, your question, the, the question I'm asking and your answer should sort of inform us as to whether really we are prepared um, as a sector um, for AI and its implications, All right? Now, let's look at what the literature is saying, um, and this will be very brief. In fact, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't take long for me to realize that uh, awareness and adoption for AI on the African continent, especially for African like this, significantly low. Signif I, could, I could probably produce two or three different slides of references talking about the same story, low awareness, low adoption. And um, what is rather interesting is that if you, if you want to assess the levels of awareness relative to um, where librarians belong to, whether academic or public community library. You'd see that within the academic and research libraries, even though overall awareness and adoption is low, there is some form of significant difference between the awareness for the academic and the research libraries compared to the other library types. And I think this is also intuitive. If you look at the kind of resources and tools that the academic and the research libraries work with day in, day out, and the kind of user community that they serve, yeah, I think it's probably consistent. But yeah, that is the state of 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 um, of um, our our awareness and adoption for AI tech tools or AI powered um, innovations. Now, in the in in literature, you would come across quite a number of limitations, but I just want to focus on this too, and I believe that these are critical talking points that um, any related conversation would want to do along. Yes, because, um, okay, let me bring this up. When you, I remember that the time when COVID broke 
a, a lot of African libraries were caught pants down because we were not prepared for um, that kind of disaster management. Uh, but what was what was impressive was how African libraries adapted and tried to catch up and still provide relevant um, library and information services in that era. Um, and I'm 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 beginning to see a, a similar situation where the world is evolving. Information technology is fast transforming, but the attention and the discussions on AI, um, it, it looks like people really are not realizing that it is this important for us um, to, to start talking about. And, and so if you look at even our curricula, AI has been in the system for quite some time. Many people probably use it and don't know that they're actually using AI powered tools. But the point is that even if you look at the existing curricula in our schools, they don't cover these things. Um, the educators, how well do they know? And how well are they able to use this in order even to transfer that kind of knowledge? And this is a, a big gap, there's a huge gap when we have to talk about the future of librarianship and developing relevant skills for libraries to so that they are able to stay relevant in, in this new age. And then we also have the problem with um, the access to technology or resources, which um, relates more with infrastructure support or infrastructure uh, capacity to explore uh, and implement some of these um, AIs. Now, what can AI powered tech help me to do? Um, we're done with all the things that I wanted to talk about, but I, I think I just wanted to outline some important, not all, but let's say some of the key things that AI um, can help African librarians, depending on or regardless of wherever you are. Now, the issue is that um, there's a lot of skepticism um, around this. Hello? There's a lot of skepticism around this discussion um, and the fear that, you know, this conversation and this concept and this technology is going to erode. But <laughs> the issue is that if you look at the potentials of AI and what it can help various types of libraries do in order to serve their communities better, it is much more progressive discussing how we can adapt to it than be skeptical. Because the truth is that the world will not wait for us. Right. And so if you belong to the public and community libraries, these are some of the things that um, AI powered tech tools can help you to do personal recommendations, chat box and virtual assistants that can help you. I think um, an example of that is what um, um, uh, Dr. Kim mentioned, mapping up of shelves and all that. A collection management helps you to um, properly define and know how to, how to um, help users identify what they need and pro provide. And then with accessibility is also another important aspect that AI can help us to, to promote. Um, I think um, Liz is gonna talk about translation services and all and, and its ability, but access has to do with how um, even information existing in the library, how AI powered tools can translate them into indigenous language, um, expanding access for people. And even in the case of um, uh, um, audio visuals, how this information can recognize voice and be able to generate information that people probably will not be able to type because of sight and all that. But then if you come to the academic community, of course, AI supports research, um, information literacy instruction, collection of management, similar to the public libraries, and an, an important part, which is accessibility and then preservation of uh, digital assets. And then when you come to the library education where you have a conversation where people are talking about how AI is going to create um, a bunch of ethical issues, going to create um, lazy people, issues with plagiarism and all that. But as a matter of fact, it has its good sides where the library educator can use this to refine curriculum development. Um, and then based on the feedback they get from um, students, for instance, and they identify some of the problems of course, this, we are talking about big data here. And then personalized learning experience where we know that people have different absorption capacities. And so AI is able to help to find all of these different learning experiences and then um, helps uh, in the development of the student. Of course, we also have the professional development, which is an important part. I thought I, it would be interesting to share some um, high level AI tools for libraries. This is like the high level type, but 
something that can be implemented in libraries. Many of these are actually free to use. All you need to know is how to get it to integrate into your system within the library. So we have the OpenAI, which um, ChatGPT is, is under, and then Dale, which is the text to image uh, technology is also under. We have the Clarify. Um, we have the Watson Discovery, the Altmetrics. All this information, I'll, I'm sure when we're done, I'll be able to circulate it. And then we have the Biblio, which is a chat box similar to um, chat DVD, but it can be integrated into your library system for people to just uh, make inquiries without even the, the direct influence of, of the library attendant. And then we have the library, and then the bots, are, and then unpaid wall, which helps you to access um, various open access uh, articles, you know, and then some other articles that are behind paywalls and all. Yeah, and then, so those are, um, like I'll call it, the high level bots that you can easily take a look at, consider how it could be integrated into your library system and then um, provide a better user experience, um, proper um, library service delivery. But also we have some of these uh, personal AI tools that um, when you go to this website, the AI library, that thousands of them, and this keeps on updating every now and then, people submitting what they've done, and you can take a look at what is happening there, pick and choose um, which tools really can help you to be a better person, a better librarian, um, a better um, a resource person serving your community, and then you can benefit from that. So what do we do? Um, yeah, there is, no, there is no turning back. What is important for us, and I'm, ha I'm happy that Afria is leading this conversation now, is that we need to be aware that things like this are happening. I mean, it's amazing that um, we, we have such low awareness across the continent, especially within the library and information sector, where whatever we are talking about, this information technology is actually something that relates to you. And to have a low awareness on this is, 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 is like being caught pants down. Now, the perception is important that we, we are aware of it and then to know its implications. And all of this would come, I'm sure, when we start the discussions. And then of course, the adoptions. It's not for us to be skeptical, it's for us to be proactive, embrace it, learn how to use the relevant ones uh, and leverage on it to provide better service delivery. And of course, there's this part which is important. There's always a balance between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Because it's a machine, it's not always the case that some of the feedback is accurate. It's not always the case that it will be working. And, and so whatever the case is, human intelligence or human support will still be required. Now, in this case, the question really will be, are you in the capacity to work with the tools? That is where the issue is. Now we're talking about job losses in the, in the light of this conversation, but it's actually going to create a new set of um, um, job opportunities. And this is where we are saying that let's bring ourselves up to, this, to the conversation, up to speed. And then um, apart from being able to use this, we need to be active leaders in this area, not sitting on the fence, uh, and then not getting uh, caught pants down. There is a need for, after this conversation, there's a need for a more specific uh, interactions and dialogues on some of these things that we're talking about. Um, yes, national level, um, um, library types, and all of this other information, all these will come into play. In fact, let me just mention that um, I, I remember just yesterday, I, I asked the chat GPT to generate a certain um, script for me for Wikidata, and it was marvelous. I intentionally created so many levels uh, so that it could really, and it, it did that in a matter of seconds. Now, here's what is happening. Whether we like it or not, things are happening. Uh, we talked about, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ankem talked about it being able to generate essays on It's actually writing storybooks for children. <laughs> yes, and um, I, I read a story where it, it, uh, AI is actually being used to administer um, um, what do you call it? Um, justice delivery. It's even better than humans. But we can't run away from it. The point is, how do we meet the gaps that are being created? How do we catch up with the new information that is, is happening? And then we're able to move on from there. So I'll end the, the discussion here or my presentation here. And then when we get to the discussions, if there's anything, I'll, I'll be able to provide more information. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Stanley. There was something you said that really caught my attention. You talked about um, you talked about uh, human intelligence and then artificial intelligence. That's machine intelligence. You know, I I know that um, machine intelligence, that artificial intelligence, that it, it it deals more with explicit knowledge. But there's that tacit knowledge that it can't see, it, it 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 can't replace humans. So. Now, when, why am I saying this? When we talk about opening up knowledge, we also talk about the localization of knowledge, the colonization of knowledge, because let's say there's an example that I, I gave somewhere. If, if, if a village has a, a um, water pump and it's false, the, the, the best option is usually to call for the people that installed it or an engineer from somewhere to come and repair it. But what if there's open knowledge about how to repair it? What if there's open knowledge about the machine in a local language that people can hear, that people can read, that people can assess and then apply? What of that? Why do Blacks need to, um, always want other people to apply things for them. We learn all the theories and then people will come and do the practical things for us. There's so many um, departments of uh, computer engineering, electronical engineering and so forth. And yes, we don't manufacture much. We wait for um, white people or other people from across the ocean to, to do chips for us, computer chips, simple things that we even have the raw materials to do here. And one of the things that we are saying is that when knowledge is open, everybody can assess this. So that there may be people that may want to strike out because there are some people that even without really um, learning all that, they can read in their local languages and understand and apply. But now, <laughs> scientific materials, scientific papers are mostly in, in English. How can AI help us? What do we do about it? And this is where we, we call on Liz to now tell us what can we do? What is going on? And what do we look forward to getting with AI on board in this area? Thank you very much. Hello, Liz. Hi. The floor is yours. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really pleased that, that so many of you have joined us and um, I thought Stanley's presentation was wonderful because I'm just beginning to learn what AI can do. And I'm certainly not an expert. Tony's going to help me. And Tony, could you start sharing my, my short um, overhead? Great. I wanted to start this presentation with a quote from Nikem because I got started in all of this through conversations with Nikem. And what she told me is that she couldn't do translations of scientific articles into Igbo because she didn't feel comfortable translating the words and the concepts. And she used examples of things like robotics, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, satellite, and orbit. She used phrase to um, explain the concepts rather than translating them. And I would actually like to say that using the concept is probably better than a direct translation. And in Chinese, for example, when they uh, translate English terms into Chinese, they frequently will make a word that explains the concept rather than try to directly translate the, the word from English. Tony, next slide. There are a number of organizations that are beginning to work on translating um, scientific language into African languages. And one of my favorites is a group called Afrique Archive. And what they do, it's actually a preprint service for African researchers. And you can post your articles online. 
um, through Afrique Archive. Um, they are openly accessible and Afrique Archive also has a translation tool which will allow you to translate from English into um, 19 languages. Um, and some of those languages are African languages. It's a very small number in, uh, in comparison to the 2000 African languages with which um, we're familiar, but at least it's the beginning. What I think is interesting about what they're doing, among other things, is that they're not using Google Scholar. And I'll talk a little bit more about Google Scholar in a minute. They're using something called G Translate. And um, they think that the translation is better than Google Scholar. It's good, but it's not perfect. And because translations aren't always accurate, and this is where we move from artificial intelligence to human intelligence, Afrique Archive is looking for volunteers to help them with translating into African languages. I think librarians are in a perfect position to do that because you know the languages that people want to speak. People like Nikem are experts in one or more African languages and you understand the nuances of language and you have management skills in terms of figuring out how to satisfy the needs of your user communities. And it could be a child, it could be an adult who wants to have health information or agricultural information, and it could be within a university setting for research articles. So in my PowerPoint, I've given you um, a, a um, email address if you're interested in, in helping Afrique Archive or if you have um, questions to ask. Next slide, please, Tony. This is um, an organization that I just now heard about. And I heard about it through doing a Google search, of course, on African languages and artificial intelligence. This is a group working out of South Africa. It is totally volunteer and they do what they call natural language processing. And what they want to do is create appropriate systems to put African languages on the technological map. And this is what Stanley talked about in his presentation. What Masakani says is that, and I'm just going to read this, the tragic past of colonialism has been devastating for African languages in terms of their support, preservation, and integration. This has resulted in technological space that does not understand our names, our cultures, our places, our history. And it goes on to talk about the problems that African researchers and others face because there is so little integration between African languages and the internet. And one of the things it points to is low discoverability. If you do a search um, for an African language and fossils, let's say you're doing a search um, and it's Kiswahili and the Turkana fossils, um, you're not going to find anything in Kiswahili unless the academic institution, which has done the research, has also made it available online in a way that internet can find it. So Masakane is also working on issues such as this. Next slide, Tony. Google Translate. I use it all the time for translation. I live in Israel, I speak Hebrew fluently, I read it awfully and I can barely write it. Um, so I use Google Translate both to translate from Hebrew into English and to translate English into Hebrew so I can cut and paste and send an ERL to, uh, an email to someone who um, doesn't speak English and would rather use Hebrew. So I know Google um, Translate a lot. 
And there are lots of African languages in Google Translate. I wasn't able to find out how many. And it works reasonably well part of the time, but not all of the time. It can translate relatively simple texts, maybe some course materials. But Nikem pointed out to me that for Igbo, and I think for other languages as well, it lacks the diacritical symbols that you need. So if you are translating a story, a short, a short story or a storybook for children into Igbo, you have to double check the translation to ensure that the spelling is correct. Google Translate isn't able to translate words and phrases into per context. It's good at direct translations, but if you're using a special idiom in your language, it won't necessarily be able to um, translate the context that you are looking for. So you have to look at and edit Google Translate results, and that's going to require some knowledge of the source content, and that means you have to have some knowledge of English. Another thing that Nikem and I talked about subsequently was that Google Translate is sexist. I don't know if the women in this webinar have noticed, but if you use Google Translate to go from um, English into your language, Google is going to use the male term for pronouns and for verbs. It's going to assume that the, the um, user is a man. And um, it means that women always have to double check to make sure that they're not sending an email to someone in the male voice and not the um, feminine voice. Next slide, Tony, if there is one. Yes. Tony, I think there's one more slide. Great. I have some closing thoughts. These aren't conclusions because I'm not conversant with the subject. It's moving very quickly. Um, I know that everything I wrote last night is probably going to be different tomorrow. The groups that are working on translating to African languages and from African languages um, are volunteer organizations. They're trying to write inequities, but they need assistance from African researchers, students, and librarians to affect change. And librarians should be central to all of this work because of your knowledge of categorization, indexing, and other skills necessary to make AI work for African languages. Um, before we mount my presentation, I'm going to do an additional slide slide with some resources that you might want to um, look at to read more about the organizations that are working in this area and some of the critiques of using AI for translation purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you, um, thank you for, for this. You know, one of the things you said about Google Translate is quite uh, true. Like I showed you, I think it was some days ago, in my language Igbo, if I write he said and ask Google Translate to, um, um, to do his thing, it will just tell me, oh, Okuru. I write, she said, he, and it will still say the same thing. It doesn't now let you know whether it's a male or a female speaking, except you now go, go down to write, that's a woman said, it will now say, okay, that's it. And that's the, um, why um, Stanley said something about human intelligence and um, artificial intelligence. But why we are, Talking more and more about this is like I said, we want to open up knowledge. We want people all over the world to know these are the great things that are happening in Africa. And then not just that, we want Africans to have access to this um, scientific papers, scientific publications. And you know, sometimes there are some terms, some 
concepts that they'll speak English around, you know, explain it in English and you, and, and, and you won't still get it. But once it's broken down in your local language, then you'll be able to um, understand it. So we hope that this, um, that AI will really help us to, uh, to do this. I'm going to write to that email you, that, that you put there, um, Liz, and ask them how Afia can, um, can um, work with them or, or give them um, the, uh, that's work with the entire um, network of African librarians, because we are really interested, not just in, in translating storybooks as we've been doing, but also these scientific papers. Some people will say, ah, but how many people will read it? Let those resources be available first, then we'll see how many will um, read them. Read them. So, so now we'll, we'll soon call on, on Tony to show us a practical demonstration of the um, chat GPT. Now, let me say this first. You know, when, when you put in a search term on Google or Bing or um, Chrome or any, any, of the, or any of those browsers and so on, it will bring you um, examples. It will, it, 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 will, it will give you websites with information that you can assess. You know, you can click on this one to read it. You can click on that one to, to read it. But there's something about chat GPT that I've, I've noticed. When you ask it a question, it will go to the whole internet databases and search for you. Not just search for you, we will break down the answers for you. You know, in groups, in sections, so to speak, so that you don't have to see the whole, you, you don't have to go to all the um, websites to now check one after the other. It, it can do it for you. So now, but um, we are going to see how it works now. Tony is going to show us an example of how it works now. But before Tony comes on now, there's something I want us to do, please. Think of a question you think you can, you can ask chat GPT. Think of a question. Do you think you can ask it how many academic libraries are in uh, Botswana? Okay. Um, how many academic papers have been uh, written by people from the uh, University of um, Cape Town? You know, just think of those questions quickly and, uh, and ask them in the chat box as quickly as you can, as quickly as you can, because uh, I'm going to take just the few, the first few that I'll see and give to Tony to show us how a uh, chat GPT will answer us. Hello, Tony. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Is your show. Yeah, is your show. Yeah. Are you, can my, my volume is okay? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. So, if you want to go to chat GPT, I have put the web page in the chat, in our chat. Uh, and then you would get, if you go there, you will get a, 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 a web page like this. And you have to sign up um, because it won't work unless you sign up. Um, I'm going to uh, now show you what happens when you have signed up. Uh, you'd have to click there sign up. Um, I've been clicking log in. So I'm just going to try and show you the um, my chat GPT. Trying to see if I can find it now. Um, the one I did earlier. Let me see if that's the one. There. No, it's not that one. It is can you see that uh, screen? It's got a black um, black down the left-hand side and the main thing is white. Can somebody just quickly answer? Yes, we can see okay. how AI yes. can assist librarians in, a, in, yes. in Africa. And somebody has asked a question that you can search for, how many female librarians are in Ghana? Okay, I will, I will do that in a moment. How many female librarians are there in Ghana. Now, before I do that, uh, I just want to show you, these are things I've searched for before. And basically you have a, a small box here to put in your question. 
and you can see that I, there's me, I've registered. If you upgrade to plus, you get, uh, you have to pay. So um, uh, the, this version is free. Um, and uh, I asked the question earlier, how can AI assist librarians in Africa? And it gave me these five things. It, that was its answer. And you will see that some of these um, relate to what Stanley and, uh, uh, and um, Liz were, were showing you. And it says an overall, there's an overall as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna answer this question. I will see what it will say. By the way, it only goes up to 2021 generally with very specific questions like this. Let's see what it says. Well, it's given you an answer. That's the answer. Can you can you see it? I wonder if I should make this a bit bigger. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm just making that a bit bigger so you can see it on the phone. Some of you I know are on the phone. Uh, okay, so it can't actually answer that uh, properly, but it's it's help, trying to help you. It says you could contact the Ghana Library Association or other organizations. Um, I don't want to spend too long doing this, but I, I'm happy to I'll put another one or two questions in, and then we can get people's uh, other questions yeah. they want to ask us. Okay. There are other questions here. One is why are so why are why are so many librarians women that the policy makers for libraries are largely male? Why uh, are so many librarians women? The policy I, makers for libraries are largely male. Can I leave that second part off, or do you want me to put it on? <sighs> <laughs> is what I saw here that I, I can't quite, yeah. the policy. I can't quite get it. The policy. Why, why are so many librarians women? But the policy makers um, in libraries are mostly male. Oh, yes, the policy. Okay. Thank you. They weren't better answer this. The policy makers in are male. Libraries is our male. I, I think it's going to struggle with this, but let's yeah, try. let it struggle. <laughs> and it's really my question um, because looking at gender um, and libraries, I found a few but not many articles about women and oh look. We do have an answer. Um, not, not unique. Ah. Interesting. <laughs> Quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's an answer. It means something. <laughs> it even talks about lead. It's related policymakers to leadership positions, which is quite, yeah. quite clever. Yeah. Um, Tony, if I can um, tip in something, you could you could actually from this you could actually request if it can give you direct references to um, the response. Yeah, and then it helps you uh, to to be able to know that this is where the the system is pulling up all the information from. Uh, yeah, one thing, um, yeah, I can't and remember I how to do that. Stanley, yeah, so you can, yes, you see, yeah, it's, it has the ability to track all the conversations. And so the yeah. next question easily relates, they are able, able to just interlink them. So can you give me um, internet sources uh, to, to, to this response? And then you're able to now get the direct references. In this case, you now can go ahead and do further research based on that. So you are not only taking the feedback that chat GPT would produce to you as golden, but you have the opportunity to now do a follow-up uh, based on what comes here. I also oh, want yeah. to mention that- That's great. Um, I also want to mention that uh, for some of us who are here, 
I am aware that um, because of the high demand when they launched this AI, uh, along the line, there was, uh, there was a seizure. They, they had to halt new registration. So maybe some of you will still be struggling uh, creating an account, but it's simply because the demand at the moment is exceeding, right? Uh, but I'm sure that as time goes on, um, they would open it up for new people to 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 produce uh, uh, to to get access. Um, to I, I, I think that there's another issue. Somebody wrote now that um, she tried to open um, the site and register, and they told her that her country is banned to use it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Beatrice. Yes, it's in I the see chat. That. Yeah, I yeah. see Beatrice. Yes. Then, wow. Tony, yeah, can I'm, you? All right. Go on, Stanley. Go on, Stanley. Please go, another, go on. I just want to mention this so that people are... Another comment I want to make, and it goes in line with um, the date. You know, this system... Um, is able to produce or generate information based on the data that it has been trained with. Yeah. So like Tony mentioned, it's up until 2021. Um, it, it has information about things that it has been trained with. Now, as much as possible, it is able to generate information based on information that is publicly available. There's a limitation. It can't get beyond paywalls or behind paywalls. And so whatever information that this platform, for instance, Assad now generates is based on what is publicly available. Now, where it becomes more important for us in how we have to adapt in helping AI become more effective for the benefit of Africans is what kind of knowledge we are generating so that AI is able to learn about African content and reproduce to audience that require African content. Now, as long as our information is not available or publicly accessible, they are unable or the, the platform or AIs like this are unable to access those informations and present them in consumable forms for our use. So yeah. we have a role, not just for consumption, but producing open access information that can help AI is existing to learn about Africa, right? And then produce it for the relevant audience. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very I, much, I, Tony. I should have just um, looked at the chat. I think Sorry. I should have looked at the chats. I could have copied and pasted, but anyway, I'm looking at them now. Okay, so Thank you. Um, that's Tony, my demo. Tony, please, can you, can you um, check this for us? Somebody say, please ask G GPT to write the following, write a short action movie script of a librarian from Aflia as a protagonist showing the value of AI in libraries to a student. Is in the chat box, you can just, good, good. Let's see what happens because, uh, oh, oh, it has started writing. <laughs> it's really, uh, <laughs> Yeah, now, one thing I would also like to say, um, um, and it goes back to what I mentioned as one of the recommendations, some form of AI literacy is, is important for librarians. Now, the point is, you get what you, um, you, you request for, right? Yeah. The accuracy of the feedback that is produced actually is related to how crisp your your response, or sorry, how crisp your question is. So in many cases, when people are teaching how to use that TPT and then a similar um, um, language models like this, they would, they would, they would encourage you to, to develop the conversation with the system up onto the point where you really want to ask your question. So for instance, in this case where we dumped this movie plot, we start with, uh, uh, a very um, low level question that sets a certain tone. Okay, so I'm, I'm interested in generating a certain movie plot um, about this and this. Are you able to give me a certain structure that such a movie plot should follow? Then it'll bring it up for you. Then the next follow-up would be, 
based on this structure, can you give me a draft of the movie plot? Um, and then you indicate certain um, examples or certain key themes that you want the movie plot to include. Now it gets deeper and as it gets, then it will generate another feedback. Then you look at it, you refine it with another uh, request. And then, you know, by the time you are done with that set of conversation, you have whatever you need in the right format, um, ask, responding to all angles of your, your query. Thank you. Thank you um, very much for that, Stanley. There's something that uh, some um, had written here. Um, but say um, I once I once asked a question about AI, and somebody said AI can write stories, and at the moment you can use it like a personal assistant to write books, blogs, articles, generated pictures, scripts, and code. In the near future, we may we may not know how many articles, books, and stories are made by humans or by AI. What do you say to that? Yeah, um, okay, so probably let me let me do this. Uh, especially in the, um, let's say in the academic world now, there's a, there's a huge debate ongoing where um, people have actually generated content out of AI. Now, the, the discussion of ethics is, is what is happening now. Now, what people have sought to do as a way of coming clean on some of these things is people are actually now citing AI, <laughs> you know, uh, and then other journal houses or publishing houses are beginning to revise their um, publishing guidelines to include that where AI content is, is sourced or even included within a paper, then you must um, declare it at the at, at acknowledgement sections um, of, of the paper. So there, there are a lot of things that are happening, but the issue is that what we have to know is that there are ethics that come with some of these things. It goes back to the first example that, for instance, I mentioned, where there is a need to declare, because the issue is that if you're an author, for instance, um, you need to be accountable for what you are saying you have created. But if it's an AI that has done that, how does an AI become accountable? You know, so all of these ethical issues are there, but the bottom line is that we are conscious of the potential, we know of its implications, uh, and then we as librarians are equipped to, based on the information we have, use it relevantly. And this is where I talk about the form of AI literacy in the curricula of library schools. That is so important. And even for um, organizations such as OER Africa and AFLIA and all those other relevant library stakeholders is that it's, it's time to really pick up this and push forward, even if it is through professional development programs. Thank you very Thank much you. for that, um, uh, Stanley. Yeah. yeah, you know, um, you see, like um, has been said in, in the chat box here, that uh, there may be a time where it will be like there will be an um, a boom of information, knowledge, books, poems, things written by AI. Librarians will need to learn how do you know this one is written by AI or by a human? Are there ways of knowing? We'll get into that hopefully and another discussion on this. Then again, because since AFLIA is driving open, can somebody use AI to generate open um, resources? Is that ethical and um, that will come again we hope in our next discussion um Labinque asked where and how african libraries can get grants and support to build capacity in these areas discussed again that's um, the reason why um, this is one of the reasons why afia exists you know we hope that as time goes on with the um CPD framework that we are building with OER Africa, that there will be opportunities for learning deeper about this because um, um, AI is going to affect OERs directly and indirectly. So we hope that uh, we can get that 
um, soon. Then somebody asked, somebody, Rodney talked about the danger of um, diminished critical thinking among people because, I mean, you can just go, uh, you can just ask it a question. Like I tried it, I, I tried it now and I asked it, um, I asked it, uh, how and librarians use AI and it has written me a long essay, a, a long essay. So, you know, if, if, if we are not careful, you know, it can rob people like is being said of critical thinking, but librarians, we need to own the voice. We, we need to own that voice that, hey, while this is good for you, remember to think. Again, remember to check for plagiarism and stuff like that. Remember to try to create things by yourself. AI can help you along the way, but don't overly depend on machines. Then there was something that Stanley said to about um, AI uses the data that is available, the information, the knowledge that is available out there. And then like Tony said, he, 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 he gathered um, data set, uh, set up to 2021. It has not done the one of 2022 and 2023. And this is really the time for Africans to, to now think, how do we get information about, about us inside there? You know, and that's one of the reasons why AFLIA does this African Librarians Week. Wikipedia and um, sister projects. Once you search on Google, they are the first thing that comes up. Once you search for any article, you know, or any, any topic, that thing that is in um, Wikipedia will jump out first. And so we need to make sure that we put in information there. We put in knowledge about Africa and Africans there. I hope that that quite a number of uh, people can um, join us for um, African uh, Librarians Week this time around so that we can do that. I don't know if we have other questions here. Tony, do you still have anything to say? I want to put uh, in a response. Not really. Oh, all right. All right. Stanley has That's something to say. Then I'll get back to you this so that if you have anything to say, yeah. Paco, Paco has had his hand up for some time. Maybe oh, like... yeah, Paco. Paco, please, apologies for this. Yeah. Please, can you hello, speak? Hello, yes, yes, hello. Yes, hello. Hello, we can audible? hear you. Yes. 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 Um, if I'm audible, thank you very much. I hope everyone is having a lovely day. And uh, as you are speaking today, Botswana is hosting Forbes Under 30. So this is one of the largest uh, event of young entrepreneurs all over the world, all over Africa to come and meet and share ideas and exchange. So my main question and my main regard here regarding artificial intelligence, first of all, what is the definition of art artificial intelligence? Because as you follow the news, there were so many articulations and news regarding artificial intelligence and copyrights. So most of the people, they hide behind artificial intelligence and they copy other people's work. But my main concern here is still the, the term artificial intelligence will stand, but how do we break that term? How do we say this is something that is artificial? If I'm able to invent a bulb, uh, using my own artificial intelligence and my own logic. So at the end of the day, I come up with an end product. But the thing is how many artificial intelligence uh, have you seen being exploited out there? And how can we identify it? Because obviously there is going to be that collision between AI and academic because someone have to go to a class to learn something to do, but some other people that are very smart and intelligent to invent some things in life. So how do they meet? And how do we protect artificial intelligence as well? Thank you very much. Stanley, can you answer him? Yeah, because he raised, he, he raised some questions, although he gave some answers too, yeah. but he yeah. raised some questions. I know that uh, we've spoken about es explicit knowledge. That is what um, artificial intelligence, that's what it 
users. It uh, aggregate uh, aggregates information from all over the internet, you know, mm -hmm. databases that it has access to, and then brings you uh, answers. It doesn't uh, list websites like an ordinary uh, Google search and so on. But again, like we also said here, it, 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 you know, there are things that you know intuit intuitively as a human being. Artificial intelligence, I don't think it has advanced to that. You know, but Stanley, please, you can answer him. Yeah, I think Tony is uh, um, sharing what chat GPT is telling us about itself. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but to uh, to sort of break it down, we're looking at systems or computers that have the ability to learn, like the way human beings have the ability to learn. So they they have access to information and they learn the information, and then based on a certain query, they are able to sift that information, right, and then prepare it in such a way that suits the query that you really really directly need. and so yeah it talks about um, um speeches visual so it's about it being able to read understand and deduce so and and these are cognitive functions of a human being but the systems are now able have been trained in such a way with algorithms to be able to do some of these cognitive functions of a human being but not all because they don't have feelings Right. Um, there was a question about plagiarism, and I think I, I probably want to chip in that. In fact, what is happening now, uh, again, in the academic world, um, um, software providers like Turnitin are currently developing features where it is able to detect AI-generated text. In fact, the, there, are, there, are other, um, there are other platforms that are existing, GPT-0, I think I put it in the chat, that is able to detect um, AI generated text, right? But it's also at the developing stage. But so what is important for us is that like we are saying, this conversation just started, right? And trust me, every day it keeps on going. When the issues of implications on authorship and originality of um, research and everything started, then all of the re um, um, relevant um, stakeholders, have also started looking at how to correct the issues that GPT and the likes, chat GPT and the likes have created in terms of um, research originality and then plagiarism and all that. So uh, yes, it is detectable because <laughs> there are other machines that have been trained to detect AI generated text. And I'm, I'm saying that it's even getting into the already established plagiarism uh, companies like Turnitin, as we know, they are also exploring that and trying to integrate that into their um, um, existing system. So yeah, there, there, there is a conversation on resolving these issues that are happening, but definitely it, it just started, right? Thank you. Hmm. This is really, you know, it's getting curiouser and curiouser and curiouser, you know, is as safe uh, ever. We've not even started, but um, like you say, this is a conversation that we started. And um, because things happen overnight, change is constant. So I believe that um, maybe by the time that we have this conversation next and AFLIA conference, hopefully, and after that, there would have been changes. AFLIA is also looking forward to if, um, if we can really pull it off to have a kind of symposium on AI and um, libraries. Hopefully it will be online, except uh, if we can get funding from anywhere to um, make it a physical thing. But the conversation has just started and um, everybody is free to join in. And also, if you're not already in the WhatsApp group for the um, AFLIA, we are Africa um, um, group. Please join us. There, it's um, it's it's open for everyone. Like I said, we are hoping to time goes on form a community of practice there, so that um, people can share the things they are doing, and others will learn from them. Um, Others will learn from it and then improve on, and it will go on and on until 
African libraries will become the go-to um, spaces and places for open knowledge, you know, and the skills to drive it, whether you're a lecturer, you're a researcher, you're a student. So that is what we are aiming for. So I don't know if we have any other questions or comments before we uh, draw the curtains. Somebody asked a question, how questionable is AI? I'm not sure I, I understand that. Do you want to take a bite at it, Stanley? How questionable is AI? Before we... Um, yeah. yeah, how questionable. So I, I would say uh, to the extent of the information that it is it is provided with, you know. Um, in fact, there 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 are others who believe that AI can easily become a tool for uh, um, promoting certain propagandas, right? And the bottom line is again about AI literacy and how it it, it works. Data is given to the system, and according to the data provided by the system, it learns about certain things, right? And so it is possible, actually, that if there's a certain ulterior motive to promote a particular agenda, okay, um, then whatever you, you would, if you ask a particular question or if you demand of a particular inquiry, then it's going to give you feedback based on what it has been fed. So yes, it is questionable. But then again, um, you would want to rely on feedback from users, feedback from experts on the internet about some of these AIs in order to you know, make conclusive uh, statements or even gauge some of the uh, responses that you receive from, from, from interacting with them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stanley. Um, we talked about um, bias, you know, discrimination. Okay, propaganda. You know, AI can be used to drive that effectively, very effectively in so many ways. We've given an uh, example in the um, WhatsApp group about um, how uh, how um, the Dewey Decimal classification is skewed against African knowledge. And then when um, you, you find out that um, that databases such as the Visual uh, International Authority file, VIF, that is run by OCLC, they use Dewey Decimal Classification for um, the things that they do there. So you, you find out that Africa with more than uh, 2,000 languages, you know, you just have one small window to um, um, classify everything there. And meanwhile, other, other um, areas outside of Africa with not as many languages as we have, they, you know, they, 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 they have several windows. So as time goes on, if this is not corrected, you ask AI, you know, to um, answer a question about African languages. Of course, it will use what it is online. It will go to VIF and tell you, oh, African languages exist, but because there are others that that's in the, in, how, 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 how do I put it now? You know, the, the, the precedent is as if these ones are not important. So yes, it can be used to, to drive propaganda unintentionally and also intentionally. So just know that as African librarians, we have a lot to do, quite a lot to do like Lizard pointed out, you know, the, 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 the translation thing, you know, to, to get our people to have access to scientific knowledge is really, really critical. So um, any, any last word, please? Any last word, Liz? Yeah, I think oh. I'll leave Liz and Tony too, because I've spoken enough. Thank you. Yeah, Liz? Well, one thing I'm going to do, because I'm really interested, um, after Tony sends me the AI answer, the GPT chat answer to my query about librarians, um, I'm going to do a little bit of searching in African repositories 
to see if there are articles about Africa that might have been um, or should have been included in the um, AI answer, and I'll let you know. Okay, thank you very much. We look forward to um, to knowing the outcome of your research. Tony? Um, not much more from me, really. Uh, I thought, uh, thanks very much for everybody. It was fantastic. Uh, really good, some really good questions. And uh, it's what the questions that talk about it's dangerous, people will be, you know, becoming lazy and stuff. It's out there. We've got to cope with it. So we're <laughs> going to have to, that's what this is for. Today's session is to start thinking and talking about it. Um, it's one of these things. Somebody has let uh, a cat out of the bag and that cat is AI. We now need to deal with the cat uh, or the genie from the bottle uh, probably for the rest of our lives. So we just need to at least understand what it's all about. Thanks and Kim. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone for coming in today. Thank you. Um, I saw people from Nigeria, from Ghana. I saw people from Kenya. I saw people from Uganda. I think I saw from Malawi and um, South Africa and Botswana. Thank you very much for coming in today. Like we said, we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Um... You're welcome to leave now. I'm just going to leave this on for a few moments while I just take down a couple of things in the chat. And you're welcome to leave otherwise. So thank you. And you can say bye bye in the chat as well. So thank you very much for joining. I'm going to put my camera off and my microphone.